Well, good morning. Uh, welcome to the day after Valentine's Day, February 15th. So hopefully you all spent some good time with your significant others and we don't see too many people here in the doghouse. But uh, welcome to week six of legislative session. For those of you joining us for the first time, thank you. Uh, during these weekly calls throughout legislative session, we aim to keep our membership apprised of potential legislation that could impact the business community and Winter Haven community in general. A few housekeeping items to start. You are all automatically muted with your video feeds off when you join the call. If you'd like to ask a question at any time during this call, feel free to either unmute, unmute yourself to ask the question or drop your question in the chat window. Uh, Anna will be watching the window and let me know if there are any questions uh, throughout and uh, we'll address those uh, pretty much at any point so you don't have to worry about cutting me off. <laughs> And um, also, I may ask some of you at the end of the call to give an update on your specific legislation that you're watching as well, or anyone that wants to give a report out. So, let's see here. Okay. And uh, again, uh, for those of you who are joining us, I was thanking uh, Mr. Davis from Senator Stargill's office, Leadership Winter Haven, uh, which for those of you that might not know, um, is a function here out of the Chamber of Commerce for our young professionals in the area. We actually did our trip to Tallahassee this past week. Um, it was a great time. We did tours of the Florida Chamber, the Florida Archives, the Old Capitol. Uh, the first day and then the second day, we got to meet with most of our uh, Florida delegation. So we got to speak from Mr. Davis uh, from Senator Stargell's office. Again, uh, she is probably one of the busiest people up in Tallahassee right now, uh, chairing the Senate Appropriations Committee and just everything that needs a dime from the budget as well as we met with uh, reps uh, Killebrew, um, Bell, and uh, Burton, and just got to hear everything that they've got going on and just thanking them for taking their time and doing everything they do for Winter Haven and for Polk County. And there they are, our fearless delegation uh, doing a great job. Uh, when on uh, the second day, I guess would have been Wednesday, we got to actually see the um, house session in progress and we got a shout out from the floor from representatives uh, Burton, uh, Bell, Killebrew, and Tomco, which is super cool. And um, for those that hadn't been there before, again, they're in the middle of it. And um, speaker um, Sprouse, he's, he's got an unusual dry wit, but he moves at like just rapid pace. So he was firing it off. And it was just really cool to see that in uh, person. And I think um, Anana can even testify. It was just um, an awesome experience for our class last week. Again, uh, we've mentioned it in past weeks, but uh, the Winter Haven Chamber of Commerce, we do have um, a dedicated 2022 legislative priority statement. Uh, these are our own goals uh, around economic, economic development, tourism, healthcare, transportation, arts and culture, as well as uh, City of Winter Haven objectives. And I believe on the backside, we've got objectives from Polk State and uh, some of our other member institutions. So if you don't know or don't have this uh, priority statement, please let us know, we'll get that out to you. And again, uh, we're tracking this and if uh, the time comes, we will engage uh, quickly and vociferously to uh, do whatever needs to be done on behalf of our fair city. And again, we are tracking every uh, little bill or every big bill that um, comes across our radar. We have a really cool uh, tool here. And uh, what you see on the screen is the front end of that. Um, so if there's something we're not tracking, please let us know. We'll add that into the kitty and um, just make sure that we're given its due diligence. Uh, we did pass the halfway mark uh, last Wednesday, I believe, and uh, Mr. Davis can uh, reiterate this or tell me I'm completely wrong, but uh, I believe um, it is assumed or just pretty much stated that if you have not um, had your bill uh, passed through a committee at this point, it's probably going nowhere for this particular session. So and we'll start to get into some that have uh, made their committee stops. And again, by the numbers, uh, you would have, if you were on the call last week or saw our recording, um, bills filed is definitely picking up a pace. I think we're in single digits on the House, maybe even on the Senate side last week, but now we're cruising right along. And bills that have passed both chambers are at 14, and I think that'll obviously exponentially climb as we're in the last uh, home stretch of session here. All right, uh, again, um, things that we're tracking and uh, are seeing the most movement and are a priority to uh, leadership right now 
Um, COVID-19 liability protections on the healthcare side being run by uh, members of one of our delegations, Senator Burgess. Um, did not see action on the Senate side this week. Um, order enrolled on February 10th, 2022. Um, maybe Mr. Davis or someone can add, share some light on that, but um, looks like we're also seeing that it's passed uh, Rep. Burton's bill on the House side was passed uh, 87 to 31, but again, this is a priority to extend that liability protection uh, because it does expire here shortly. Um, again, a few other things we're monitoring here um, on the local ordinances side. Um, this is a bill uh, seeing movement. Uh, Senator Hudson, this passed 28 to 8, and now is on the House side. Um, don't believe we've seen any movement on that. But again, this prevents burdensome re regulations by requiring local governments to adopt business impact. I'm sorry, I switched sides. Uh, for this local ordinances one, um, the House did not take action. And this is through, uh, through Rep. Uh, Gil Lombardo. So I'm um, still waiting to see if that uh, gets traction on the House side. But uh, prevents burdensome regulations by requiring local governments to adopt a business impact statement before the adoption of an ordinance and awards attorney fees if it is found by the courts that a local ordinance is arbitrary or unreasonable or that the ordinance is prohibited by law. And um, similar to that, on again, for local government, uh, allows business to recover damages from local governments if an ordinance or local government provision creates a significant loss in revenue. Again, this is uh, being run by Senator uh, Hudson. This one passed uh, Senate 22 to 14. And on the House side, no action as of yet on uh, Representative McClure's bill. Uh, Florida Tourism Marketing, again, this is uh, the funding for uh, Visit Florida, which is the state's tourism marketing arm uh, being run by Senator Ed Hooper. Um, passed the Senate 36 to 1, uh, now in House Messages. Um, the House Companion, uh, Linda Cheney, uh, no action this week. Um, but again, extending this uh, beyond October 1st, 2023, and I believe this is seeing good traction on both sides. I don't think there's anything cause of concern as of yet, but, um, oh, we have notes, I'm sorry, again. Uh, da, 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 da. Um, both chambers included a 50 million line item for Visit Florida in their budget proposals for uh, financial year 2022 through uh, 2023. All right, um, on rural economic development, Senator Albritton, uh, this bill is sponsored by one of our local delegates, again, Senator Albritton. This encourages development and job growth and opportunity zones in rural communities. Last week, it unanimously passed the Senate Finance and Tax Committee 7 to 0, as well as the House Infrastructure and Tourism Appropriations Subcommittee 12 to 0. It is now in the House Commerce Committee. Um, Senator Manny Diaz's uh, student assessments, again, trying to get away from that year-end uh, do-or-die uh, testing system to throughout the year uh, monitoring uh, progress system um, on the Senate Appropriations Committee uh, unanimously passed um, uh, that committee in last week's hearing. Um, and again, um, we talked about leadership, uh, Winter Haven Class 41 being up in uh, Tallahassee last week, and this is actually uh, the committee we got to see in, and we're in the middle of public comments. So that was really cool for everyone to see. And it was actually quite riveting. Um, uh, Senator Stargell runs a tight ship there, but um, it was cool to see uh, proponents and uh, people against the bill, but uh, that one did pass uh, unanimously uh, through the Senate. Um, no action as of yet, or maybe again, you might get some more clarification from uh, Mr. Davis, but um, in my notes, not seeing anything else um, on the House side as of yet. Um, okay, so um, I believe we might have had this one on the call last week, but uh, relatively new, trying to track this one. Um, this one, uh, first Senate Bill 1412, um, this would limit uh, the subject of citizens initiatives to procedural issues to deter out-of-state lobbyists and special interest groups from influencing Florida politics. 
Um, this one last week passed the Senate and Ethics Elections Committee with a vote of five to four. And I think um, what we've seen in the past is just outside interest groups uh, trying to circumvent our uh, legislature. And again, just try to get things onto our Florida constitution, which is much harder to amend and much harder to get out if uh, things were to go awry. So trying to just clean up that process a little bit. And again, this one passed the Senate Ethics and Election Committee five to four and uh, waiting to see action on the House side um, with Representative uh, Beltran's uh, House Bill 1127. Um, again, um, big on uh, consumer data and privacy. Uh, this is uh, House Bill 9. Uh, this bill has to do with consumer data, data privacy. Uh, basically, the bill would regulate companies that collect or sell consumer data and provides consumers the right to request that data uh, would be deleted, not sold or corrected. Uh, while the bill unanimously passed the House uh, Commerce Committee 23 to zero, there seems to be a lot of opposition to it. Uh, the biggest concern is that the bill contains a private right of action as an enforcement mechanism if the business fails to correct, delete, or stop selling uh, that personal information. Uh, this means that the consumers are responsible for enforcing the law instead of the state government which could lead to a wave of lawsuits filed against uh, businesses. However, passing this bill is a huge priority for both uh, House Speaker Sprouse and Governor DeSantis. So again, on the House side, uh, 23 to nothing out of uh, the Commerce Committee and wait to see if uh, that starts to gain some traction on the Senate side with um, Senator Bradley's uh, Senate Bill 1864. And again, uh, getting hot and heavy into uh, budget season. And um, I think uh, the preparations committee led by Senator Stargell starting to bear the brunt of that. Again, I think Mr. Davis will go into a little more detail, but things are starting to pop on that side. Um, but last week, the House and Senate uh, did um, pass their budgets through the respective appropriations committee and will be taking them uh, to the floor this week. Uh, once they're passed out of their respective floors, they will use the conference committee process to iron out the differences in uh, the two budgets. Uh, the two chambers have until March 8th to finalize the budget in, in order to meet the constitutionally required 72 hour cooling off period. After the 72 hours, uh, there will be a final vote to pass the budget before it goes to Governor DeSantis uh, for his signature. As a reminder, this is uh, the proposed budget totals for each chamber. So um, again, I've been told this typically goes right up to the wire. Uh, we have a drop dead date for our session, but again, we have uh, the constitutional requirement to pass the bill. So even if uh, the budget, so even if the 72 hour cooling off period extends us past um, the predetermined time for session, uh, they'll stick around and vote on that. Um, some items of note in the budget proposals, um, both the House and Senate budgets include the same funding for Visit Florida, which again is great, and Enterprise Florida's um, operating budget. So um, tourism and economic development looking good for this session, uh, 50 million and 12 million respectively. Both the House and Senate budgets also include a lot of the same funding for economic development there. Read ahead in your notes, Nick. Anna's doing a phenomenal job. So <laughs> thank you, Anna, for being diligent there. Uh, funding for affordable housing is an area where uh, there are discrepancies between the two budgets. Uh, the state does have a fund for affordable housing called the Sadowski Fund that collects small taxes on real estate transactions or earmarked for affordable housing. However, lawmakers have been uh, diverting or sweeping, as they say, the funding uh, for other projects, taking $3 billion between 2001 and 2020. Uh, last year, the legislators uh, agreed to decrease the amount of money going into the fund and forbid further sweeps of the money. But there are concerns that lawmakers will backslide on this deal. Uh, both the governor's and the Senate's proposals ask for over 300 million for affordable housing programs. It's now a game of wait and see on what the conference committee brings. And again, um, just having the uh, constitutional mandate to balance the budget is oftentimes that the Sadowski fund is kind of the area where they will um, acquire money for that uh, balancing, but um, again, trying to shore up that that, that uh, mechanism because obviously we all see the need in our area for um, affordable housing. 
Um, congressional reapportionment. Um, again, uh, this is a big focus this week. Um, this is the current proposed House congressional map, which keeps the hotly debated District 5 largely intact. Um, Governor DeSantis believes that District 5 has been gerrymandered and uh, requested that the Florida Supreme Court review it for constitutionality. However, last week, the Florida Supreme Court rejected um, Governor DeSantis's request for review in a five to nothing ruling. Uh, the Senate passed their proposed map earlier in session and the House published new map for consideration, which again, uh, does keep this district largely intact. If the chambers formally adopt their proposed maps, it is likely um, that DeSantis will veto them though. Um, regardless of what happens, it looks like Polk County will become uh, one U.S. congressional district for the November 2022 election cycle. So again, we're kind of split off. Uh, Scott Franklin's district goes west in the Brandon Plant City area and Soto's, uh, Representative Soto's district goes hard into Oso County. This um, would, um, again, make us one more uh, contiguous congressional district. And uh, that ends it uh, for our prepared remarks here. Are there any questions uh, on what we've spoken about so far? Um, if there aren't any, then I will um, ask anyone has any prepared remarks. And I see uh, Mr. Davis's uh, video um, popping on there. So um, Mr. Davis, if you want to jump in first, I would love for you to tell us all the great things going on up in Tallahassee and with Senator Stargell's office this week. Good morning. Good morning. So, uh, yep, this is week six, and things are really um, moving fast at this point. Uh, any bill that has not been heard in its first committee is, is likely dead because starting next week, uh, none of the other, uh, well, actually starting this week, none of the other substantive committees are meeting, and they are not scheduled for next week, and I believe that uh, there is a cutoff point where they can no longer meet. So, um, at this point, we're not expecting to see any, anything new pop up um, as far as through the, the committee process. Um, this week, we are taking up the budget, both the House and the Senate budgets are being considered on the floor of each chamber. Uh, today, the House will be in session and uh, today and tomorrow, and the Senate will be in session on Thursday and Friday. So by the end of the week, we will have a budget uh, in both chambers, um, and then it'll just be a matter of time for when they decide to call on the uh, conferencing process uh, to begin. Um, just uh, working back, there were quite a few things you brought up that I can address uh, with the Sadowski Fund. We actually got the letter thanking us for fully funding the Sadowski Fund in the Senate budget. So um, we did honor that commitment. The House is a little bit short, and they're encouraging the House to meet us on that. But the Senate actually, uh, really for the first time since I've had this job, have we got to thank you for fully funding it. So that's that's a good sign if you follow that issue. Um, as far as I believe you, you brought up the COVID uh liability um, bill that the that Senator Burgess and Representative Burton were carrying that actually has, has passed both chambers and uh, when it says order enrolled that means it is um, on its way to the governor so uh, so it is it is completely um, finished uh, what, what might look a little bit uh, confusing on your uh, bill tracking process is when one bill is laid on the table another one's taken up then that just means that they've swapped one for the other but both have passed both chambers and are um, it is now enrolled which means it's done. It's uh, it's just waiting for the governor to make a decision. Uh, let's see what else. The, the district maps that is still a, a hot issue up here right now. Uh, the Supreme Court last week when they ruled that they could not make a decision, um, the governor was asking for clarity. Uh, what, what, we, what we have going on here, are those minority majority uh, districts, um, those are kind of a uh, a court created uh, concept, uh, taking other constitutional um, protections of minorities. Um, they decided in 2016, when we were going through the, the uh, whole redistricting um, process in the courts, uh, they decided that, that those districts need to be maintained and, and can actually violate the stated constitutional language that the districts need to be compact and follow geographic boundaries. Uh, the governor is taking issue with that. And so his map that he dropped would create two additional Republican seats um, following the guidelines of the uh, compactness and geographical boundaries. Um, if, you, if you've looked at the District 5, it's kind of like a snake right down through, uh, coming down just south of Jacksonville, down through Orlando. Um, very similar to what we saw with, um, oh, what's uh, the con congressional woman who's, uh, I think she's in jail now. Anyways, um, it's, it's, uh, it's been challenged Green Brown. before. Yes, thank you, Green Brown. 
Um, it's been challenged before, and he's hoping that uh, the, the court would find a, a similar um, unconstitutionality in, in creating those districts. The court said that his request was just too broad. They could not make that decision at that time. Uh, so that does kind of frustrate the governor's plans. And what we, we've been on hold ever since the House still has to consider congressional maps, and they've just been canceling their reapportionment committee meetings. Um, I, I do believe they might be meeting this week. I have to go back and check and see if that's still on. Uh, so hopefully we can pick up where we left off. But that has kind of created a little bit of tension between uh, both, both chambers, Senate and House, versus the governor on those maps. Um, something else that came up uh, this past week on Wednesday, everybody was up there. The, the appropriations uh, meeting in the Senate had a scheduled nine-hour meeting, and that was because they were going through the budget. But along with that dropped, I think, like 13 or 14 what we call conforming bills. A conforming bill is a bill that has um, policy language in it, but it, it's matching up to items that are in the budget, being considered in the budget. Um, it, it could be a very technical bill, but sometimes these policy uh, ideas that are in the conforming bills can also be major issues that uh, would have would have been in a, a regular bill and gone through the multiple committee process, uh, you know, been vetted by uh, the public. There would have been more notice about those. Um, so when these conforming bills dropped, it caught a lot of people by surprise. Um, I'll, I'll give an example of one that that uh, we, I think I've already talked about that's very important to us, and that is the creation of a sixth district court of appeal in Lakeland. Um, but that bill actually had a House bill. So that's already been going through the regular process in the House. That should not have been a total surprise uh, in the Senate. And I don't know the reasoning behind why that I, I think maybe we thought we could just fund a new courthouse and then they decided that uh, they needed to actually have the language that would conform it. So uh, but the but the big one that's getting the news that is causing all the the, the trouble right now is the uh, the agricultural conforming bill um, that would uh, you know, we created a few years ago, the reservoir south of Lake Okeechobee to try to deal with the, the discharge and try to prevent the algae buildup. Um, this conforming bill would require uh, the Southwest Florida Water Management District, or excuse me, the South Florida Water Management District, uh, get that right. Um, they would have to certify uh, recommendations to the Army Corps of Engineers rather than having the Army Corps just uh, make their own decisions. Uh, it's really a battle between the state versus the federal government and in, in control over that process. Uh, what happened when that conforming bill came out, there was a group of activists called, uh, I think they're called Captains for Clean Water, um, that showed up and uh, protested the bill. And um, then the next day, the governor issued a statement blasting the conforming bill himself, um, using very curiously similar language to these uh, protesters. Um, that, that have links to a group um, that, uh, I mean, I, I won't, I'm not trying to get political, so you can go back and look up and see what links this, this group has. Um, but this has caused a lot of tension now between the governor and the Senate um, because, uh, you know, this is a concern of the Senate presidents trying to protect uh, the, the state control of how the state's money is being used in, uh, in dealing with Lake Okeechobee and the Everglades. Uh, it really, the broad picture, it's an environmentalist versus state rights kind of a thing. Um, they're trying to pit it as a sugar farmer issue. Uh, if you remember back in the governor's primary race uh, that, you know, we were all following Adam Putnam and all of a sudden he got blasted for, uh, you know, carrying the, the agenda for the sugar farmers or whatever. I, I forget what the rhetoric was, but it's all kind of tied into that. And so you can see the, the politics of it all now there's there's some some uh, clearly drawn lines between the executive branch and the legislative branch, and we have to navigate the rest of session with these fights playing out. Um, so I I hope that I didn't get too uh, too partisan there, but I think you know I work for the Senate. You can kind of guess where I'm at on some of these issues, but uh, but that that is coloring everything that's going forward. So if things start to happen that don't make much sense, uh, just look at the broader picture um, and see how everything might. Or might not be connected. Um, some other things uh, I want to bring up: some bills that are moving right along. Um, there's a oh, the House created last week a bill called the it's a trust fund called the Budgeting for Inflation that Drives Elevated Needs Fund. This uh, this created I think it was a two billion dollar trust fund to try to help offset the costs of uh, the, the state 
spending costs of uh, inflation. So if there's anything in the budget that gets affected by inflation, this trust fund is able to come in and supplement and help out in those areas. Uh, I repeat, that's the uh, budgeting for inflation that drives elevated needs funds or the B-I-D-E-N fund. Um, that's coming through as a house bill right now, Chad? Yes, the house uh, the house filed it last week. So uh, so they're called the Biden fund for short. Um, and uh, that, that kind of uh, caught people off guard as well. Um, but you'll probably start hearing more about the Biden fund going forward. And then uh, let's see, what else? There's another bill that's getting some national attention. Um, the critics have dubbed it the Don't Say Gay Bill. Uh, what it actually does, it's, it's piggybacking off of the parental rights bill last year. And I will read you verbatim. This is the, the actual provision, so you know exactly what it says. A school district may not encourage classroom discussion about sexual orientation or gender identity in primary grade levels or in a manner that is not age appropriate or developmentally appropriate for students. Uh, primary grade levels, the Department of Education says by rule, by their own rulemaking process, is grades K through three. So, um, so that's what the limitation is. It's being portrayed as, uh, as they call it, don't say gay, and they're, they've got a commercial now, just came out yesterday, of a little girl trying to talk about her two mommies and getting called to the principal's office for bringing that up. That's not what this bill does, obviously. I just read you what, what it says. Um, and, uh, and it's being misconstrued, but it's actually gotten the attention of the president. He's already been tweeting about it. I think the vice president's tweeted about it. Um, uh, Pete Buttigieg has also tweeted about it. So I bring that up only because it's, it's getting some national attention. Um, and there's a lot of confusion about what the bill does and does not do. And I will say part of it has, has been uh, um, spawned by a, a lawsuit in Jacksonville where an elementary school student uh, was being, um, it was socially transitioned at school behind her parents' back. They didn't know for months that they were calling her by a different name, using different pronouns. And uh, they were telling the girl she can't tell her parents because the parents will not accept her. And she uh, attempted suicide twice. This is an elementary school student. Um, so you can kind of see where, uh, you know, some of these things we're putting into law are meant to try to, to protect. And, um, and uh, that just gives you the, I just want you to have the background because, like I said, it is getting that national attention. If you start seeing, you know, people mocking it or making fun of it or, or, talking like we're curtailing speech or anything. It really is not. It's dealing with curriculum and teaching um, uh, the, the, the discussions about sexual orientation, gender identity for K through three. Um, other things going on this week. The, let's see. I, I think that might be all of the stuff that I pulled up that I wanted to touch on. Um, I, I don't, I don't know what, what's going to happen uh, with our, our budget process. Everything right now is on time for us to finish um, finish on time, uh, but, but I don't know anything can still come up with the conferencing. I don't believe we are that far off between the House and Senate. There are, of course, priorities, but it doesn't sound like, it's, uh, like, like we're having major disagreements there. I think the bigger issue is going to be um, how the governor plays his hand and maybe some of the things he brings up. He, he does have that line item veto with the budget. So um, any of the priorities that are being put in there or uh, possibly some of these conforming bills, I mean, there's a lot of stuff there uh, that, that's up in the air. But um, at the most, I, I could, I now I am hearing talk of a potential special session, but that's really more to deal with the uh, congressional district maps as opposed to getting the budget done on time. Um, but otherwise, uh, I wore my Blue and orange today. It's Gator Day. Uh, those of you who came up last week, it was Seminole Day, uh, and today is is uh, we give UF their turn. So there's a lot of activity going on today with uh, with the University of Florida. Um, it's you know always fun to be up here during these these days and the celebrations. But uh, yeah, that's I, I think that's about uh, about all that I have for you. Great, thanks so much, Chad, and thanks for clarifying some of the stuff I stumbled through. It's nice to know that there's uh, smart people up there that are into the weeds on some of these issues and. Uh, or understanding the reasons why, as opposed to just what gets printed on the page. So uh, thank you, and uh, please give our best to the Senator. Yes, yeah, my pleasure, and I will. Great. All right, that's it uh, for Mr. Davis. Uh, are there anyone else that has a report out, or just any questions you might want to bring to this group? I do, Nick. Um, and, hey, Ryan, uh, good morning. Good morning. How are you? How is everyone? Uh, for those I don't know on the call, um, I'm Ryan Reeves. I'm new here at Weber International University. 
Um, but I did come over from the Lakeland Chamber and I was doing advocacy over there. Um, first of all, I just wanted to uh, thank you, Chad and Senator Sargo for all the work you guys are doing up there. Um, and I just wanted to segue into a piece. I don't believe it's on the Winter Haven agenda, but I do believe it's impactful to uh, the Winter Haven economy and Polk County as a whole. And that's the EASE grant uh, funding and the qualifications for that, that the house side is looking to put in um, that will automatically uh, uh, remove nine schools, uh, nonprofit, private nonprofit schools from funding that voucher for students, it's about $2,800. Yeah, that's about 600 students. Um, I hear on the Senate side uh, that uh, most are not keen on uh, those qualifications, um, especially enacting them and then having them go into the next academic year. Um, I heard a uh, rumor that uh, Senator Stargell is not really keen on that. And um, I hope that's a, a true rumor there. Um, but do you have any insight on that um, or anything you want to add to that? Because um, I know when it gets to appropriations, uh, it can be devastating to Southeastern, Florida Southern, uh, Weber, Warner. And right now, a school like Florida Southern won't be immediately impacted, but if their criteria continues to raise, I know Dr. Kerr is concerned about that as well. So I didn't know if you had anything to add or, um, you know, we, we could benefit from the support on that. Sure. That has been an ongoing issue. Um, it's come up in years. I mean, really every session I can remember. And uh, especially the last couple of years, there, there are some members in the House that are really pushing for those, those standards. And uh, may, they don't seem to fully appreciate the value of a private liberal arts school, especially one that is uh, faith-based. I got my undergrad at, at a private Christian liberal arts school. So um, they, they don't fully understand maybe the nature of the degree programs. Um, why people might change their degrees so many times. Well, sometimes those are people that are con contemplating the ministry going back and forth to religion majors. So uh, things like that. And Senator Sarlo has a very good understanding of those issues and has been very supportive of protecting um, the, the, the grants as is. But she has also been having conversations with some of the leaders of these schools, letting them know that uh, you know there may be some needs for some standards if you can come up with some that you could live with. Uh, so we can maybe try to meet them halfway. I have not been a part of that conversation this year. Um, I have been more involved with that in previous years, uh, but but her general overview has been to protect um, those grants for these schools because uh, she does value very much what these schools can do with those and the students that are able to go to these schools, and and she understands how they how they work and how they're just different, um, and how these are options. You know, we don't want to take away. Uh, Florida residents uh, options when they're looking at schools that they are personally choosing to go to right. uh, just because um, maybe, you know, that we had this, this discussion last year with Florida Bright Futures, depending on what's, what major students want to want to major in. Well, there are reasons why students go to these schools and, uh, and we want to be able to support those choices to go to these schools. And um, I, I think, I think she's still working on that issue. I'm, I'm have not heard too much concern right now internally about it, but um, but I would encourage the leaders of these schools to continue to reach out and make it known how important it is. And uh, and I, I, I but I, I think I think we're still I, I don't think anything's changed on our end. I think she's still working very hard to protect those. Well, thank you. I I think all the schools agree. If there's a clear definitions uh, on the requirements, that would that would be uh, beneficial. And so um, we appreciate uh, any efforts to to help support. Um, and continue that that ease grant funding. So thanks, Chad. Sure, and you're for welcome. For those who don't know what the ease grant is, it's the Effective Access to Student Education Grant, um, and it comes from the state government, and it's for Florida residents that decide to go to a private college in the state of Florida. So, like Ryan mentioned, that's you know Weber, Warner, you know Southeastern, Florida Southern, University of Miami. Even um, the funding changes every year, but right now I think it's around like Ryan said. Two $2,800 that automatically gets allotted to Florida residents. Uh, do we have a current position on that? Is that I don't something? believe so. Okay. I just, from my experience, yeah, no, I appreciate that. Yeah, Ryan, if uh, that's something you want us to help you with, um, I'm not, again, you know, we're a little short staffed here at the chamber at the moment, yeah. but um, if you want to help us to help facilitate anything with the Florida Chamber on just kind of their stance on that topic, I'm more than happy to help out. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Nick. I'll, I'll look into it. I know at one of the Lakeland Chamber, we did take a stance on it because it does impact and it, it can be used for nursing programs and things like that. And I know the Florida Chamber is big on the shortage in healthcare. 
so, you know, it just provides that opportunity, um, like uh, Anna said, for students and residents of Florida to have those options, whether it's public, or private. So anyway, well, I appreciate that. And then thank you again, Chad. Awesome. All right, thank you, Ryan. Anyone else that has a topic of discussion or any questions uh, that we can help answer today? Okay, see you none. Uh, appreciate everyone jumping on this call. Again, Ryan, thank you for uh, the question. And uh, Mr. Davis, thank you again so much for everything you're doing. And uh, again, um, appreciate this group. We'll uh, be live again next week and uh, continue out through uh, the remainder of sessions. Everyone have a great day and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you again back next week.